Communication is the central core of human existence. Without clear, concise communication, errors occur. Even neurons communicating to each other is central to multicellular life. An advantage humans have is that of speech as we can convey an idea of experience to another person without the other person having to think or experience it for themselves. The downside is that often what is being conveyed is too foreign to that person's experience or thought process and it can get dismissed or feel in violation of reality, leaving the burden of proof up to you. I have been noticing disconnects throughout even the atheist community that people assume that all atheists don't need certain things explained to them and just go with it because it's such a part of their experience and the way of thinking, either through their job or personal biology or their education. As we keep repeating, atheism just means a lack of belief in God, and it's not until the disconnects in communication flare up that this point is so clearly glaringly shown. A disconnect can occur in three ways that I know of at this point. A communication major might correct me in ways I'm not aware of. One occurs when there is a corruption in the chain of information and dissemination. One occurs between someone who has had a forced experience and someone for whom that experience is impossible. And one can occur just based on differing interests caused by many reasons, including culture. When these disconnects occur, and the disconnect directly benefits someone, they will work to widen that gap, dehumanize the other side, misinform, use logical fallacies, biased framing, and charge language. We shall refer to these people as opportunists. A communicator is one who tries to bridge that disconnect and tries to humanize both sides, inform via the facts, use logic and evidence, use unbiased framing for quicker information uptake, and use neutral language. The use of fear, charged language, and satirical dehumanization can at times serve a purpose as a shock to wake people up, but it should be used very sparingly, or one can create the same effect as the opportunist. Most often, pointing out the argumental flaws, ignorance and blind spots in the facts will produce enough guilt or shame from cognitive dissonance on its own. One of the biggest disconnects we can use as an example is that of science versus the public. Sadly, there is a chain of information from the science community to the common person that many are trying to bridge thanks to the internet, but it's a slow uphill battle with all the money involved and not just from the misinformers. When a long chain of communication exists and everyone has something to gain by slightly stretching the facts, it becomes a collective unintended conspiracy of misinformation. Let's refer to this as an opportunist cascade. Science has for many years relied on a chain of information to get what it's doing to the common person. It often goes from science to pop science news, for the more nerdy inclined, then to actual news. Sadly, then it goes to the fringe news outlets, then word of mouth. Sadly, both pop science and the news have a financial agenda, and that is to get people to buy or read their stuff. Quite often, they're driven to stretch the claims of certainty a bit, or stretch the significance toward future impacts of the study. Even some of the top scientific journals contribute to this as they will only publish papers more groundbreaking in science and won't publish the more boring papers. After that, the fringe news groups will take it from the news or pop science and stretch it even more for their own agenda. The opportunist cascade keeps the common reader thinking that the science community doesn't know what it's doing or that it can't be trusted because there is some conspiracy to lie to them, like the issue of climate change or evolution. There is a conspiracy in the dissemination of science, but it's unintended and caused by individual links in the chain of information driven by their own particular agenda that accidentally creates a wide gap of disconnect between scientists and the common citizen. The monk-like devotion that grad school requires can also reduce a person's ability to explain things to the average person, increasing that gap even more. Science has been dehumanized ridiculously, as they aren't required to interact and explain themselves to the public, which would cost more grant money and would take them away from their work, but if they were all required to interact with the general population, they would have even more money that they could employ more scientists with, that would move science light years further ahead and with a much less ignorant population. Government has the same problem. 
where often the politicians are too busy trying to get money to get reelected and less time trying to explain their reasoning to their constituents as to why they voted the way they did. So often the public backlashes because they're devoid of the actual facts. They rely on a communication chain of a politician, their party, the news, then of course fringe news organizations, and word of mouth. Of course, this creates a feedback loop where if a politician can't communicate well enough and the opportunist sees a way to profit, that person can lose the election, replacing them with a new politician that can often be an opportunist themselves. A reason I think for-profit money should be eliminated from the dissemination of information of both science and politics, but that's another story. Of course, it doesn't help at all when the government owns the only news source, like a dictatorship, or when one of the major parties is owned by one of the few major news networks, like in the U.S. Another issue is that of forced experience versus impossible experience. Quite often, a person can have an experience that another person never has had and never could just because of biological or cultural differences. An example of this is that of being a black man. I can never experience what it's like to be a black man. However, after the Trayvon Martin case, I became painfully aware of how sheltered and parochial my experience of reality was. I became aware that most young black men had to have a talk that I never had to have. Black men, depending on the region, often have to be taught how to go out of their way not to look like they're doing anything suspicious. Not because they're doing anything, but because there's a wired bias in society that certain behaviors mean that a young black man is up to no good. There is, of course, the counter-impoverished group that just say, don't trust the police, as a blanket statement. However, if a black man wants to be successful, according to quite a few self-justifying reports, they have to go out of their way to appear non-threatening or not suspicious. They are guilty until proven innocent when people are watching them. Quite often, this stigma leads to bitterness and creates a self-fulfilling prophecy where if they're expected to act a certain way, then why not do it and enjoy some of the benefits of it? This is an experience I will never and can never have unless I was to, say, go to an African or Asian nation where there were a stigma against whites. I've been told by an Eritrean that if I was to go to Eritrea, the Caribbean, or other parts of Africa, I would be treated like crap and suspiciously for being a witch with my red hair and blue eyes. It would be the only way I could experience what a young black man has to deal with. It's not something I've ever experienced, nor something I could ever experience. So there are two reactions that can occur when confronted with this. They can feel immediate guilt as a paradigm shift occurs, as their awareness is raised. This guilt from ignorance is caused by a cognitive dissonance of reality when one realizes how good they've had it and how they've ignorantly gained from and contributed from the system.